Ladies and gentlemen, DBNA Television is proud to bring you a Roar Media production, the nation's number one digital coaches show. If you do not know him, you better Google him. He was a high school Hall of Famer, school record holder, 10 time letter winner. He was just a boy with a ball and a young man with visions of greatness from the land of Hoosiers. When his playing days were over, he wanted to give back to the game that provided him purpose. He had found his passion on the hardwood. 14 years college coaching, multiple regional and conference championships, multiple national rank programs, coached the National Player of the Year. Winning followed him to 15 seasons professional coaching, multiple championships, multiple Coach of the Year honors, near 780 win percentage. He placed over 100 players to their respected national teams that represented their countries at the World Championships and Olympic Games. He has coached current and former NBA stars. His purpose is now to serve, empower, inspire. Here he is, host of the Coach Scott Field Show. Make some noise, show some love. Host Scott Field. Hello everybody, this is the Coach Scott Fields and yes, sometimes the game is so good there's got to be a continuation. This is overtime because the conversation with Key Smart was so quality and so good, we had to continue that conversation. This is part two of the Keith Smart conversation. Coach, did he set the tone? Because we were in a, uh, before the season started, we were in the locker room. And he said to to the team, he said, Daryl, Steve Alford, Daryl Thomas, Steve Alford, and Todd Meyer, you three will be the first group of seniors to graduate from here and not win a Big Ten championship. So what did that do right there? It galvanized the team. Well, man, you know, we, we got to get you guys a, a Big Ten championship ring, you know. You said you'll be the first group of seniors that ever played for me that, that didn't win a Big Ten championship. Wow. So it pushed us again together to focus on the Big Ten championship, you know. So as we went out to start playing, uh, we were – not playing for us, it was playing for that group of seniors. He said, you guys will be the only ones in the room to sit at the table and not have a Big Ten championship ring. Wow. Okay. And now here they He's are. He's pushing them buttons, baby. <laughs> buttons. And I, I, you know, when I when I finished playing and got ready to get into coaching and I asked uh, Dan Doctors, I asked a question to him. I said, you know, we were talking about coaching. And, yeah. And I said, man, I got to ask you a question. I said, do you guys sit in a meeting prior to practice and determine that this is what you're going to do today or who you're going to challenge today and things like that? He said, oh, yeah, coach always plan things out. And I said, you know why? Because it's too organized. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. it was never like off the cuff or things like that. So it was just too organized how things were done, you know. So today, you know, we had this thing when you come on the floor, you had to go through this ball slaps, you know, a certain dribble right hand, left hand, behind the back legs, and all this stuff here and jump rope uh, before you come on the floor and start your shooting workout program. And I remember one day I was coming in a little late, so I kind of went through half of it, got on. Coach comes flying out on the floor and go, you see right there, you cheating everything you need to do. If you cheat on this now, you will cheat later in life. I was like, okay, you know? And so I knew then that uh, he was kind of planning these certain things to kind of put have different trigger points to push those players that he felt he can push them a certain direction, you know, and um, and I was one of them. I remember when he got on me one time and uh, I wasn't playing. He sat me for a couple games, you know. Oh, and- I remember you telling me this story when we were at the NBA Summer League in Vegas and we went to dinner and you yeah. told me a story about how he set you for like four or five games. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, yes, yeah, please share yeah. that. Share well, that. He, you know, he, he, he's, he, you know, when I played that summer, I made the Pan American team. And we oh, played, with Coach Denny Crow. Yeah, Coach Denny Crow, right. <laughs> and I played there. And I, uh, and the reporter asked me, um, he said, uh, well, hey, you play for Coach Crum and you play for Coach Knight. Well, what do you think? Is there anything different about the two? And I just said, you know, well, you know, Denny Crum's style kind of fits me, you know, fits my style of play, he press, he runs, and things like that. Yeah. And I said that. 
and somehow that got back to coach, you know, and uh, coach oh, got, yeah. I, hey, he doesn't miss anything, right? <laughs> and he's and this is before social media, you know, so he got everything. And so he said to me, uh, I came back, he said, you know, you should transfer it. You should go to Louisville. And and I'm kind of like, he's told all a lot of players, you need to transfer. You won't play here this year, you know, but that's just him telling the senior you won't play. And so as we move through the season, um, you know, I was playing well. Uh, he said, um, oh, you're not playing Indiana basketball. You're playing to go to the pros. You're playing to go to the NBA. You know, you're playing that way. And he kind of knocked me down, you know. And so I got bent for these couple games. And at the same time, while he's taking me through this, he's talking to my mom and my dad and telling them, look, I'm going to take Keith through some things. Um, and he's probably not going to play for a couple of games. Uh, but I want you to know that uh, I, he we thing under control. And so what does that do? Now this is happening. So when I call my mom and say, hey, I don't know why I'm not playing, all I say is, baby, just keep working hard. Just keep yeah. working hard. Yeah, cool. yeah, I've been working her on the other side. You know? Yeah, you didn't know he was calling your mom and dad. <laughs> so we're going through that portion and uh, eventually – uh, I never forget the first game, which no one told me I wasn't starting that that next game, that that game, first game I didn't play. So they had made the introduction to all the players, and then all of a sudden, my name doesn't get called. So I'm thinking because I was like pretty much the second to the last person to get called, or the last person got called, um, and I didn't hear that. And so I figured, all right, I'll, I'll get in the game later on. Coach is going through something, right? So now game moves on. I don't get in the game. First half, don't play. Second half, don't play. No one's talking to me now about this. And so I don't play for the first game. Come to practice the next day, no one has said anything to me again. Next game, don't play. Then finally, we're getting ready to play Purdue. And um, and so I'm thinking of playing this game, but I don't know if I will play this game. And so the game moves on. Coach calls me and said, hey, Keith, no, smart, smart, smart. So I go into the game. And I come off a screen and I take a shot and I make the shot. And he goes, I smart, I don't want you shooting the basketball. I want you passing, cutting, and screening. And I said, then take me out. And I said that. And my roommate, uh, you know, oh boy, <laughs> he rose up by the bench. He said, Man, when you said that, I heard that so loud. And so coach calls me over in the break in the game. He calls me over. He said, now that's what I wanted you to do. I wanted you to stand up for yourself. Wow. Just a test. Just a test. Role. I was going to keep you in this role until you said something for yourself. And I did. And after that, I got back in the starting lineup and started playing and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and ended up having to play catch up for my, my senior year, but I ended up having a really good uh, run down the stretch. Oh, wow. Great story. Cause again, all, all he was doing was just testing your character. He was testing your your mental toughness. And again, that mindset, he was mm -hmm. going to bring the best out of you. And if you think about in today's society, these kids are so entitled that they're not playing. Oh, they're hitting the transfer portal. You know, they didn't mm -hmm. have that toughness to, to, you know, stay in it, you know. Right. I, I you know, I, I look, he said, OK, what happens when you what you love to do or want to do gets taken away from you? What do you do? You know, so. I loved playing basketball. I was competing. Then all of a sudden, I get that gets taken away from me. Oh. But at a particular time, to where it won't be lost, you know, where it's going to be, you know, where it's going to be a thing where you can't recover from it, you know. Yeah. So what life when you go through that? You're going to have to figure out a way. What do you do next? Do you keep working or do you shut down? And so I knew when my son uh, went off to school to play, and uh, he wasn't particularly happy with, a, you know, with, with something. And I said. What are you going to do about it? I just asked him, what are you going to do about it? You know, so I'm just, I'm coach with my profession, but I got to be yep. dad. Also. That's right. I said, well, if you have an issue with this player, you two need to get together and you need to go talk with him. You need to talk with your coaches. You need to talk with this. I love it. And work that relationship. And that's how you develop that relationship. And that's what uh, he ended up, he ended up, they ended up doing. And next thing you know, he, they have a good year, you know. And yeah, so, great uh, advice. So I, I did the communication portion of it. Who are you going to turn to uh, when you when you started to feel that uh, you're being pushed away from something? 
then you find those people that you can rely on and uh, they help get you back on track. Oh, great stuff, Smarting. Great stuff. And and I love it. I, I'm just, again, just thinking of so many life lessons that you're sharing that are so innate for you because you were drilled on it and drilled yeah. on it and you had repetition, repetition that now it's become a lifestyle for you, but also part of your philosophy uh, as you know you get into your coaching career at the nba level which is amazing mm -hmm. yeah you, you know all these things you know from my high i was very fortunate I, I, I look back on where i've gone and how i got to these different uh points in my life my high school coach you know um how he his training six o'clock in the morning workouts training you know um Disciplines. I'm an early morning person. You are too, you know, but life forces yep. us to get up early. Our jobs force us yeah. to get up early. Yeah. You know, um, you know, so being around that environment, my, my, the high school that I ended up going to McKinley high school was known for playing for state championships. So that mindset is always different. Their approach, how they do things. Yeah. You know? um, my junior college coach, Jim Carrey won at that time. The NIT was a big tournament, you know, was pretty big. He won an S the NIT tournament, you know. So his he won uh, uh, NCAA, excuse me, a junior college, two junior college championships back to back at Mobley Community College. Yeah. Uh, so his mindset was always championship thinking. So I was always around that. Then of course I go to Indiana, then I'm there with that championship thinking. So those little things that you focus on when you were young gets poured into you, you know, conditioning. I mean, even to a point where when I was at Indiana, we had a, a, a team meals and they were basically centered around pasta, uh, you know, with either with sauce or with meat sauce. You would also have a hamburger patty, uh, things like that, pancakes, right? Scott, Arms literally, and protein. <laughs> literally, I would still eat that when I was playing and then also as coaching. That was my pregame meal. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I never deviated from that, you know. Then later on I did, but 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 that was just that what I was trained and taught the right way. I felt that you know taking care of your body with the right foods and things like that. You know, you know, a guy wanted to give me a piece of fried chicken. I'm like, oh man, you can't eat that, man. That grease is gonna be on upset just went through all those things. But those are things I would I would learn. But things that you're learning while you're working and working with young players and people, coaching people also, you can share those stories. You know, you can share those stories because you have already gone through it. That's and right. Those experiences. You can share with them because now they're on that track that you were once on and yeah. you can help uh, see some of that. Yeah, see, and I love that. And when, when I think of that championship mindset, immediately my mind drifts to think about what Nick Saban's doing, just like what Bobby Knight was doing that Alabama football team. I mean, he, he he has a system, he has a philosophy, he recruits players that fit that system. He, he you know, then he starts preparing their mindsets to, you know, right. compete at a certain level. So there's mm -hmm. parallels to why that is successful, whether, you know, it's on the field, on the court, or in life or in business. It's a mindset. Yeah, you're right. And, and, and you know, you're a very humble guy. You know, you've coached championship teams and you've cut the nets down and all the places <laughs> you coach and everything. Um, and so when you're approached to it, like your show now, you're trying to make it into a championship level show. You know, <laughs> you're coaching people every time you're on here. When you're bringing other people in to speak on here, you're coaching championship level the way you're doing it now. You, I saw your introduction uh, that you sent me a couple of days ago. And I'm like, man, 10 years ago, look where you were compared to where you are now. You know, oh, and so thank you. That's what you, you're trying to do with everything that you come in contact. You know, we as coaches, once we move into that realm of coaches, we may not be a team of players, but we're coaching a team of people. That's right. So it, it could be one person. It could be 50 people. It could be at a clinic or whatever it might be. But these are all things you learn from the places that you were, you know. And um, and just listen, like I told you when, in the beginning of the show with my wife and I watching the even my since my son plays football, I would never get Carol to sit there and watch a football documentary. You know, right. yeah, or because we have a son that does play uh, in, in college, um, she pays attention because she wants to just know more and more about these things. You know, and um, and so as we're sitting there watching this, I'm just seeing and hearing all the parallels that have taken place back then, already to what I experienced and to what I hear other coaches. Uh, talk about the championship level coaches and then also you start to learn 
um, there's a book, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but it's called My Losing Season. Mm. And it just goes through the things of, uh, that sometimes you always think that you learn a lot because you win a championship, but you also learn a lot when you lose a great deal. Amen. Because you start to find character and development of skills that you have to have that's different than a championship coach. But sometimes someone who wins, win, 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 and we all want that, all of a sudden adversity hits at some point. It may be a smaller level. It may be a big level. But then how do you coach in life and coach your teams out of those situations? When I got ready to get into coaching, something Coach Nash shared with me, he said, look, make sure you organize, prepare. Because when you organize and prepare, you'll come out of those situations quicker than if you're someone who's a random type coach or a random type worker. You know, but when you organize and you are prepared, because now you you have uh, tracks that you can lay down. Why why did I fail? You know, what happened here? You know, always document your stuff. You know, I I, I use this little blue pad and I keep uh, notes and so I can refer back to situations that I'm that I uh, that I'm dealing with or going through and look at, okay, okay, I did this. You know, why did I do that? You know, I should be doing this over here, you know, because you're always preparing for the next step. That's what you're always looking at, but you can only prepare for the next step based on how. That's right. It's it's so funny you say that because here are my notes. And you just now said, you know, that book, My Losing Season, I wrote it down immediately so I can go research that, read it and grow from it and empower myself to be a better version of me. Yeah. What what is all the stuff that we acquired, uh, you know, who was it? Denzel Washington was speaking and he said, uh, I've yet to see. Uh, a hearse with a U-Haul attached to it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Anything with you? So why would it, why do we want to harbor all the information that we have and not pass it on to someone else? Amen. You know, that's what we're doing, and that's what uh, you know. Having a show like yours has has been able to do for so many people to bring them on your show to talk about their experiences to pass that on. And like you said, you, you're talking to someone, you write down something, you go back and look at that. And but what but that's what what happens. So you look at a, a championship coach and hit and, and that's the way when you read that book, you're gonna see a championship coach of Nick Saban's caliber or Pat Riley caliber, and you'll listen and read the stuff that they talked about, and then you'll read about a coach who struggled and you'll see the parallels. And what you'll find, the only difference was that this coach won. That coach didn't, but they went through the same thing. You know, you see championship level teams still go through issues that they have on those teams. You know, a team that's not winning will have the same issues, playing time, shots, touches, football, whatever it might be. And the same thing happens on the championship level. The championship level team just has a thing of finally saying, let's put that on the back burner and focus on the goal and the team. There you go. Whereas a team that's not winning will continue to focus on the inner self more than anything else. I like it. You know, and that's that's great, great tools for the toolbox right there. And I'm thinking, you know, what you said about minutes ago about organization and preparation. It's so key because if you're not prepared, you can't just wing it. I mean, I mean, yeah, it may be a flash in the pan success, but for you to sustain success, that's where that organization and preparation and that attention to detail comes in because you know if you don't pay attention to the details man little things become big things in a hurry especially if you don't address them in a timely manner and then with that energy and enthusiasm and in that purpose you start to inflict your will by leading by example and i'm thinking about that as you're telling the stories you know even with the example of your son I mean, he's now wearing number 23, just like his daddy did. And I'm seeing, I, I've been watching him play for the University of Hawaii. Young man has worked extremely hard and he's having great success. And that, that you know, that acorn didn't fall far from that tree. And I'm sure it's just, he's probably picked up more things by just modeling your behaviors and actions, what you may have shared with him verbally, you know? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Because, you know, one thing I, as a, as a dad, and coach and, you know, and father, what you, you know, I saw a lot of coaches, a lot of players, former players with kids now pushing their kids. Want to do that? There were certain moments that 
wanted to do that, you know, because I knew that, okay, you got to get to this level of training or work ethics if you're trying to keep moving in this direction. So I didn't push him in a certain direction. I was going to be dad. I just wanted to be dad. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to fight with you on you having to work out. I wanted to fight with you on you having to do your homework, you know, things like that. And so, um, you know, when you start hearing, you know, cause obviously, he, you know, being in college, you dealing with the media. So he'll say certain things and he'll say, well, my dad talked about this. You know, we went over to visit him uh, when he first got to, got to school and I did an interview on, with him. And he just said, you know, my dad always said, you got to work hard for what you're trying to accomplish. Oh. You know? And they said, well, that's why I work the way I work, you know, and they started talking about, well, you know, when practice was over, he would go over to the machine, the passing machine and run his routes by himself, you know, put a load up a few footballs in there and run his own routes, you know. And um, and so when you hear those things, you're like, OK, he's figuring it out. You know, he, he's pushing himself to those level. You know, of course, he, you know, think he can jump a little bit, you know, and so, <laughs> Comes home. And I think I might have shared the picture with you, the photo. But he uh, comes home, and we have a spot in the house. And he said, "Dad, can you touch that?" And I said, uh, "I said I don't know." He said, "Well, I will tell you what. You know, these young kids today all want to have a, <laughs> get a, you know, a tattoo." He said, "Dad, I tell you what. If you can touch this spot up here on the ceiling, on the on the uh, wall, um, I'll never bother you again about a, a, a tattoo or earring." You know, being a college <laughs> kid. And I said, All right. So I'm thinking in my mind, oh, how, boy. Can I get, how can I get up there? You know, as you get older, you're not thinking about uh, getting up there. Your work issue is the landing part. That's <laughs> right. Hurt when I come down. Hurt to land. <laughs> so I said, All right. So I first time and you're overthinking it. You can't get up there, you know. And so I went up to touch it, couldn't get it. He started laughing. Oh, I, get, I can get this done. I want to try one more time. Couldn't, couldn't even come close to it, right? And finally, I just gave it up. He said, okay, I can get this done. I said, no, son, I want to teach you something here. He said, uh, the one thing in life you got to understand, sometimes people are going to say things to you and it's not going to be the truth. So no, you still cannot get your ears pierced or get a tattoo, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love yeah. it. But That's it, a it, great story. Of course, you know, eventually getting everything done, but it was just a little moment there of teaching. And then he had a play last year uh, where well, he went up and caught this pass up over these people. And I'm sitting there like, oh, my goodness, you know, how he caught this ball. And I had a picture, uh, you know, right up in here that I have in my office. And I said, man, he, he went up and got that ball, you know. And he said, I think I can jump higher than you than you could at, at that age. You know, I said, you know what? You're probably right, son. You're probably yeah. right, you know. And of course, he's won two bowl games, got two bowl game rings, won a championship here in California, state championship in football in college. And he goes, uh, uh, Dad, I think you're behind in the ring count now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Good job well, that. I, I love it. And, and again, mm -hmm. Smarty, I, I think too of the analogy, you know, a candle does not lose its flame by igniting another flame. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, here you are igniting so many flames and, and empowering the, your sons. And I can remember just a couple of weeks ago, Brandon's playing over in Europe professionally and um, he had a triple double yet. You know, he, he's, you know, away from home and, you know, it's overseas and there's challenges. And he starts sending us these messages on WhatsApp and it was real positive and uplifting. And Kim looks at me, she goes, babe, she goes, that's you talking. Mm -hmm. And it just it almost brought a tear to my eye because I was like. It, it just makes you feel good that, that you know that you're helping your kids and you're guiding your kids and you want to see them be successful and you just try to steer them in the direction, but yet let them make mistakes and let them fail because that's the best teachers in life is, you know, sometimes to have a little setback. Yeah, well, that's, that's what you, you do. You, 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 you lay out um, a direction and they won't go in that direction like you want it. They may fall off and you hope they get back to the line. If you fall off, get back to the line. Get back and on the you, tracks. Yeah, and you're just there to, to help them with that, you know. And I always say this with young coaches who are coaching. You know, like I, I right now, this during this time, it's been a tough time for everyone. But it's also been a great time for me to step back from it all and now becoming a mentorship program and a, and a consulting program uh, with several coaches that are in college wow. and pros. And talking wow. with them, we'll have chats and they'll call me up and we'll go over these different things, scenarios and 
And, and I say, one thing you got to understand, you're trying to coach these kids to where you are as a coach and person. They're not there. You have to coach them where they are. Where they're at. Meet them where they're at. Coach them where they are right now. And you're trying to get them to where you are. You know, oh, I think great point. a lot of times we coach from our experience. And we say, well, hey, Chuck, you know, got Chuck person when he, I worked with him at Cleveland, the Cleveland Cavaliers. And he always had a statement. He just he said made this statement, and I use it to this day. And I told him, I said, hey, man, I'm going to keep using this statement because I think it's very uh, profound. And he said, um, we always say, well, didn't we talk about this and shoot around this morning? And you go in the game and the guys can't execute it. You know, didn't we talk about this yesterday at practice? And they can't put it together. And he said, you see, information without demonstration is just conversation. Oh, and Power. I said, man, that, I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to use this. I'm always going to give you credit for saying it, but I'm going to use this. You know, so when I give you information, I have to now make sure we have some demonstration by practicing, executing, talk about it, tell you how to get there. And now it's not just conversation anymore. You know, we have now implemented it now and we have worked at it. We've talked about it. We worked at it. Now it just comes down that, you know what, we're just not good enough <laughs> to carry yeah. it out. Wow. But it wasn't, it wasn't from a lack of knowledge that we didn't go put this together and work on it. You know, when you get ready for your show, I'm sure you you probably prep yourself, prepare yourself, maybe even with yourself as you're being the interviewer, you know. That's right. That's you right. Know, to get yourself ready. So all of a sudden you see this moment. And see, that's what happened with me. All those days of playing basketball on that court by myself put me in a mindset. So when I was in that particular moment, You've already done it a thousand times. I've already seen it. And so it was strange, man, because people say, I didn't look like I was emotionally excited about that moment, you know, because I wasn't like oh, running around, oh, you know, doing all of that. I was, but because I had already saw that. Nicholson Elementary uh, School behind my house, not that far from my house, that I would go shoot. And I would take that shot falling out of bounds, make that shot, five, four, three, two, one, make that shot, and then celebrate. I was celebrating 10 years, 15, 20 years before that moment. You Love know, you it. talk in the house with the Nerf ball. We would have the little uh, uh, gallon milk jug, cut the bottom out of it, cut the jug in half, and we would pin that up on the wall and was able to take shots off the glass, off the side of the wall on the right side, bounce it over to the other side, you knew exactly where to hit and make that shot. Yeah. You know, so all the moments there um, is when you start to, uh, uh, it start coming back later on in life. And, you know, the, the, the one saying the uh, instant superstar, the instant millionaire or whatever. No, man, that started way back. That's you know? right. No one yeah. sees that road. Everyone sees the road that you're on now, but not the road that you were on to get to that point. Amen. Amen. And I, I think, you know, that, that Chuck person uh, statement that you made, you know, talk about the demonstration. And yeah. I think that's so vital right now, Smarty, with coaches, because this younger generation, these players are so visual. And I think they're so visual because they're constantly on their phones. Yeah. They're constantly mm -hmm. on their computers. They're constantly mm -hmm. on their Xboxes or PS5s or whatever they are. Mm -hmm. And that visualization, if we as coaches don't use that technology that we have in front of us because players are so visual, if we don't use that, it's a huge mistake as us as coaches not mm -hmm. to use that technology available to us. I mean, we can sit there and, and talk to them and talk to them because the best coaches are the best teachers. The mm -hmm. best CEOs are the best teachers. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have to use those tools for that visualization for that player so they can see what we see so we can help empower them to get to where they need to go or where we know they can go. And we may have more belief in them than they do their self, but we have to build up that confidence in that individual through that visualization and through that demonstration. No, you're absolutely right. Because, you know, you, you, we, you have young kids, you know, we know how to communicate to them, you know, we may call them and not get a phone call, return phone call for a week. Yeah. But, but we text them <laughs> and it's like instant, they're going to re respond to a text, you know, yep. that's where we are. You know, with some of the players that I've worked with, you know, I would, as I'm breaking down film situations, you know, 
uh, in the game or with coverage or whatever it might be, I would videotape that, that what I'm communicating to them about, videotape that, put my little captions on it, you know, and then text it to them. And immediately, pretty much, I would get a response back. Oh, coach, now I see what you're talking about. You know, oh, yep. You know, and so because that's how they respond to things now. You know, um, yep. you, you're taking a kid through a video because he's going to be looking at video all day anyway. Yeah, you know, he'll be on YouTube. Yep. Yeah, he, that's what he's going to be looking at. And so the best way to communicate to them was to send film uh, mm -hmm. to them, um, you know, in their medium that they're in. And that's how you got a better response for them. And I say, okay, tomorrow, we're going to work on this right here. See this move right here? Because oh, the best teacher for a drill that you're trying to set up is to look at the game. Mm -hmm. Create your drills from the game. I shared this with a coach. Amen. A couple of years ago. I said, Amen. Shit, create your drills from the game because we can have our own uh, drills that we want to put together. It looks good on that blue paper. But the actual game drill uh, is much better than that because he's going to be in that more time than your drill that you have for practice. Yeah. And so we share that. And, uh, and I showed, I said, just, just look at the game and see what drills you need. The, the, the game will teach you the drills that's needed, you yep. know, that's and, right. But that's, that, that, but that's how you have to communicate to them. Now, you know, I play over in Europe, you coach in Europe and you know how lonely it gets over there for a young person, you yep. know, you just going to practice, coming back, going home, going to practice and everything. And um, and that young player is figure things out. And when I played over there, coach once told me, he said, just play as long as you can. Because <laughs> yeah. you won't be able to play, you know, but as you yeah. said, for all the time, you know, just play as long as you can and learn as much as you can, because guess what? It's going to come back. I share with the guys, I said, you know, when you get to a veteran as a veteran player, and all the players start, you know, we joke with this with Vince Carter. They call him you old head, you know, old grandpa, you know, and you're an old man, 38, 37, right? Yeah. And, but as soon as you walk out of that door as a professional athlete at 37, 38, you become a young man again. You're a young man in life now, 38, yes. 39, Tom Brady, 40, what, 42? 43, yeah. <laughs> But when he but when he walks from his last game, he's gonna be a young man. Great, <laughs> you know. So you have a whole life ahead of you uh, to focus as a young person now, who you just crossed over. You know, so you go from one minute you being an old pro, the next minute you're a young man, and now here comes life coming at you full speed, and that's what you're trying to get these young guys to to, to focus on. And so I said, when you're playing professional sports, you play as long as you can. Your body holds up, you play it. And then once you're done, you move on. But you're learning things to help prepare you for later on. Is the, that's the biggest key there. Amen. And see, and I love that because I'm thinking about, you know, the things that you're sharing. And I'm thinking about as coaches, as you talked about with videos and, you know, the, you know, your captions, you know, for the video for them to see visually. Yeah, you got to emulate and you got to simulate that yeah. game speed. Vi let them visually see what direction they're going to go as an individual to make mm -hmm. the team better. So mm -hmm. I love that emulation simulation to make it as close as possible to that championship level. And then yet I can remember with some of my teams, I would use video from teams two years before we went on a championship so they could visually see the execution of the play. Then that way it gave them a visual picture of what they could do when we mm -hmm. put them in that same position. But yet when you go out and, and practice it, if you're not going game speed, those habits, and that, that muscle memory is going to carry over, just like a golfer in a golf swing. You and mm -hmm. I have had this discussion before. You need that muscle memory and those mechanics, just like an all off Steph Curry with that quick release. Mm -hmm. He's done it thousands and thousands of times over and over where he knows exactly what he can do when he's put in that situation. No, you, you, you're, you're right. And you, you talk about games because now, you know, because now from having a chance to coach and be around the NBA and be around the science of the NBA and all those things there, when you speak of game speed, you want to go game speed so that your body can respond to being at game speed. That's right. You know, when all because you you are shifting a, a momentum shift, a deceleration coming into an acceleration that you have to now be able to still be on balance. That's why we talk game. That's why the old school coaches back when we grew up, 
they didn't understand. We didn't have the the analytical part of the game right, and, the, right. and science behind it, but they had a notion to understand that you have to play at this speed because the game is going to require that speed. You know, the, we talked about the conditioning that I had to learn how to play in a motion offense. Why we did the fifty fives, one tens, two twenty, all of those things there because you there's a different level of of conditioning that you need yeah. to be in to run a passing game and run that shot clock for 35 seconds and you still constantly pass and get rid of the move and cut those things there you know i remember when you try to put a passing game in sometime in the nba you got like hey wait a minute what's going on here? <laughs> oh <laughs> i love you, it you, you didn't train for that you know and so that's you know as you're coaching and teaching people on the on the airways you know with the people you bring in contact um, that's what you're trying to get them to go at life with game speed. You know, you yep. have to act it like that. And I think for having an athletic background, you know that you got to push through uh, certain things, you know, and you got to make sure you don't do things that's going to be detrimental to you trying to push through, you know, yep. learn from those mistakes and don't repeat those mistakes. Wow. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, Smarty, this is, this has been awesome. And you're dropping nuggets here uh, with our viewers and I'm so grateful um, yeah. want to switch gears here let's take it let's take it from like a year ago today yeah. February coach Bobby Knight is coming back into assembly hall mm -hmm. who was the person who first contacted you to say hey we're going to do this for coach Knight and we hope we get coach Knight to, you know come back for that game in Purdue I mean I remember Dickie V on ESPN I remember seeing Mark Cuban and Sage Steele there in the crowd mm -hmm. But who was the person who contacted you to say, hey, Smarty, can you get to Assembly Hall? Can you get to Bloomington, you know, for this reunion for Coach? How, how, did, how did that process start for you? Yeah, well, it, it started with Randy Whitman. Randy Whitman Randy. has spent some time with Coach and uh, along with Quinn Buckner and uh, Scott May. And they started talking about this thing. Coach had, Coach had he actually moved back to Bloomington. And uh, that actually moved that far from where my in-laws live. And so he had moved back to Bloomington. And so they was like, okay, you move back. Because I call, you know, I call coach probably like once or twice a month. And I called him one time just to check on him, see how he was doing. And uh, he said, well, I'm getting ready to move. I said, we moving. Where are you moving to? And he said, I'm moving back to Bloomington. My wife says she's moving. And I said, well, I better go with her, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so Randy had went down to Bloomington to spend some time with him. And uh, they started talking about, uh, about him coming back. He said, man, the, the fans. They want, they want to see you again, coach. They need to see you. You're here. You might as well do it, you know? So that conversation started. He had contacted me earlier about getting back, you know, to Bloomington because coach is going to come to a game. And then, but it wasn't sure, you know, because coach would change his mind and say, you know, yeah. not everybody's coming and no one shows up. And um, so he, he said, you know, I think he's going to come for this game, but I'm not 100% that he's going to do it. And so are you available at this time? And at that time, we had just got to let him go in New York. And so um, I, I had time, but I wasn't, it, it, it didn't work out. So yeah. coach decided not to go to that game anyway, so it didn't work out. Then he came back again. Randy said, we, I think we got him. I think we got him convinced to come wow. back. So he started calling and talking to all, all the former players. Because what they were going to do was going to celebrate, the, I think it was one of the Big Ten championship teams. We were just going to him being in town, coming to that game to celebrate that team. And then they switched gears and said, let's go through every arrow that played for him. Oh. Let's get those guys back. You that's know? magical. And, and that's how it started. And it started to snowball and everyone started communicating and the university started, uh, you know, started communicating to all the players who were going to be able to be back there for that particular time. And then we all got back there. And wow. like I said, you looked at all these guys and you looked at so many players and, and seen all these people and their wives and their kids, oh. you know, teammates and their wives and kids and all these things that we had and talked about, you know, and all the stories, like I said, all the stories start to show up. But Randy was the guy that uh, initiated that with, uh, with along That's with beautiful. and those guys. And, and then I, I think about that because Ted Kitchell was roommates with Randy Whitman when he was at IU and had great years right. and great success. And, and you, I think of, you know, the, the names that, that you're mentioning, you know, you talk about Quinn Buckner and Kent right. Bitton. I mean, there's your set 
'70s, and then you know, like you said, the '80s. You know, your guys, and then then the '90s, and you, you just think of, of the number of lives that coach has positively impacted with mm-hmm. those life lessons and and practices, and it's just a beautiful thing. Because I remember I was talking with you, and you sent me a text, and it was you and Coach Knight mm-hmm. sitting there to chair. Right. What, what was those conversations like? To you know go back and 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 talk with Coach, and what were yeah. things that you guys discussed? You know during those times when it was just when it was just Keith and and Coach. Right. Well, that one the picture that I showed you there was the, the conversation that I had started with him was the when I took the story about my mom. Okay. When I was, that he was, I said, Coach, you may not remember this, but I, but there's a time when uh, you benched me, and uh, and I wasn't playing, but you were talking to my mom, and he and he just said, he said, you know what, your mother and I have a great relationship, you know, and uh, oh. it was those type of things. When I got ready to get into coaching, you know, um, I, you know, he, Coach, I always wanted me to come back and coach at Indiana. You know, he wanted me to come be an assistant coach with him. And I said, oh, Coach, I don't know, because I, you put your assistants through some stuff. I, I can't deal with that one, brother. <laughs> I said, no. But when I finished my playing career um, uh, it, and I came back my last year of playing, I had a contract to go back to Europe. But we were getting ready to have our first child. And we didn't want to have a baby overseas. And Carol, um, we actually, good thing we didn't because the baby came early. You know, Andre came very, very early. We would have been over there, no family over there in Europe. It, 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 was, it wasn't going to be worth it. So we, I decided to stay home. I said, I'm going to try out for the NBA team. If I get cut, I'm going to go to the CBA and play until we had a baby. And then I have a contract to go back the following year to play, finish up playing over there. And that year, I went to Fort Wayne, Indiana to play with the Fort Wayne. Fort Fury. Wayne Fury. Yeah. Fort Wayne. And the coach got sick, coach named Gerald Oliver got sick, and I became a player coach. And then from being a player coach, um, we finished the season that summer, because uh, in all season I was having basketball camps and I was doing speaking engagements. And so one day I had a speaking engagement. I cut up some chicken that morning, and I went out uh, to do my speaking engagement. It was gone for several hours, came back home, and was going to cook that chicken later that night. And so Carol said, um, there's something that trash can smells. Can you go get, get rid of that trash, that, take that trash out? So I take the trash out. And the place that I lived at was called The Point. It was a little outside, outside of Bloomington, uh, about 15, 20 minutes outside of Bloomington. Uh, and it was a retirement area. But since I was still playing, I wanted a place that I could, you know, it'd be safe and everything uh, while we were away when I was playing overseas or what have you. And so it was a little, little, little uh, a house out, out, out of, on the lake. And um, so we had that. I, I take the trash out. There was another guy who was a y- younger guy. It was probably was three of us that was probably the younger guy. Everybody else was retirees out there. And uh, so, I, we, so we're talking. It was very windy and dry. And he was on light bulb duty that you know, we were rotating around. He was on light bulbs. So he was going around the different venues, putting in new light bulbs. And so... Um, he said, man, this, this wind is crazy. You know, I said, yeah. And as I'm walking back to my place from the dumpster, all of a sudden, because we had a communal dumpster dumpster area. And so as I saw the first house, the flame shoots through the ceiling and come up and through the roof. Oh. And this, I, that house had a cracked uh, flue in the chimney and the fire somehow got into those walls. Wow. And so I'm walking back to my place, which is about eight homes from my house. At that time, a lot of the wiring, uh, electrical wiring ran across the top of the houses. And so I get back to our place and I told Carol, I said, Carol, there's a fire, you know, several houses from us down the street, you know. And so the back part of our uh, uh, house were up against a lake. OK. And so as I, we, we, we get I get to her, tell her that there's a fire. We had a son. Normally we would put him down and take him upstairs to go to sleep upstairs. Well, by the time I got back to my place we could smell smoke and there was smoke already upstairs in the house. Mm. And if we'd done that, I would, we would have put him up, up, up to bed and we would have came back down watching TV, you know? And so, cause the fire hit those wires and just ran through the houses. Well, 28 out of 32 homes got destroyed it out there that night. And, um, wow. you know, so I said, okay, all right. When, when I was getting ready to go back to Europe, I bought a lot of shoes. You know, when you buy a shoe, find a shoe, you take them with you back to Europe. And so I took my, was going to take those shoes with me. They all got destroyed. And I said, you know what? Maybe this is a sign from the Lord telling me that my basketball days of playing are over. 
And that's when I started to get into Coach Knight wanted me to come back. He said, look, I want you to come back here. Coach, you know, a lot of your peers um, are now in this second tier of coaching. You know, if you want to be a coach, build a program and build a winning program. Uh, you, you've been playing, been out for nine years. You know, uh, you have an opportunity to come here with me, sit with me for five years, and perhaps you go get you a program. And then you go to another program. So at that time, I was 35. He said, so now you're 40 by being with me for five years. And then you go to another place and you're there for another. So now you're 45. Now you're finally in a program where you can build to try to build to become a winner. And now you're even. And so at that time, the coach wanted, the organization wanted me to become the head coach in Fort Wayne because that coach had gotten sick. He said, well, you want to, would you want to be a player coach next year? I said, no, I can't do that. I can't play and coach. That's just not working. I said, no, we want you to come back and be the head coach for next year. And uh, I, so I went back to coach, told him, I said, hey, coach, um, I got this opportunity. They want me to coach in Fort Wayne. And he said, you know what? That may not be a bad idea. You should do that. Go coach wow. in Fort Wayne. Um, and if you don't like it, don't work out, come back with me. And I said, you know what? I'll give it a shot. And I went up there and started coaching and started to enjoy it and started to have success and started to, to win and started to get players developed and moved on to the NBA or over in Europe for a bigger contract. And, uh, and it just took off from there. And, but then it went back to what he said to me about you make sure you organize, you make sure you're prepared um, mm -hmm. because you're going to have tough times. And when those tough times happen, if you're not organized, it's going to be a struggle. Wow. And little players leave to get called up to the NBA, your dynamics and team change. And so that was the, the portion of, of, of how the coaching part of him coaching me moved me into the coaching profession. Love it, man. I, you know, coach, it's a, I, I love hearing these stories because, you know, we've all had life vests thrown to us at some time that mm -hmm. kept us afloat and kept us going. And then we, you know, we, we fall back on those life lessons and habits that we picked up through, you know, our experiences through sports. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, hearing that story, it's almost like Coach Knight had a blueprint for you yeah. so he could help you be successful. And I love hearing that story. And and thanks for sharing that. But, you know, I, I think about, you know, last February, I, I it looked like the electricity in wow. Assembly Hall was just amazing. What yeah. was it like coming through that tunnel with Coach, Coach being recognized, the crowd erupting? What, what was that feeling? What did it look like? What did it feel like? Well, when, like I said, when we were sitting in, there, in the, the holding room, you know, where all the former players were all and their families and wives and everyone having discussions back there. So you can feel the emotions of it all. Because each player, like you saw me sitting with Coach on that photo, yeah, yeah. I, I had my time with him, you know, and then another player would come in and have his time with him and so forth. Some of the wives who were girlfriends at that time, you know, that kind of didn't know Coach at that time, but over yeah. the years got to know him. You know, wow. uh, visit here, or there, or a phone call here, or there. Got to, got to, you know, no, because even when I was co playing, he would say to Carol, like, when is he going to stop chasing that ball around the world and start, getting, <laughs> you know? And, um, so, but getting ready for the event, you know, um, because at first the players, when they had thought about it at first, to have the players uh, for one particular Big Ten championship team, they're going to be able to sit in the arena and watch the game. Yeah. But because they shift gears and became this huge group of players, it's like, there's no way we don't have any room for that. So yeah. we're going to keep you guys in this area back here for all the players and families. And so the momentum was starting to build up. And then when finally uh, they came in, and so they started lining up by this class or this team here this year. And we all started lining up and everyone starts getting there. And then coach got up and started walking around with Quinn, I think it was, and they started to get themselves ready. Wow. You hear the fight song and we all had the, uh, the red jackets on with our number on it and everything. So we all uniform with each other. And so we're getting ready to move to the staging area to start getting ready to hit the floor as halftime is getting ready to come down and you start to hear the roar. And then when the first group mm -hmm. of fans start to see the, the assembly of coach Knight of the players and the group that's going to come out, uh, Coach is still off to another area. And then finally, they start introducing the team, the different teams. And they start going on the floor, introducing them one by one. 
all the emotions of your playing days came back. Oh. Mm. You see of red and white. Uh, you, you you saw it on the floor where you were at one point. You saw Dick Vitale because you know national national level team. You always had a, a top level uh, broadcasting team that was there at the games. You know, so you start to see all those things. So the the energy was just off the chart. Everyone kind of oh. like their their young. 18 to 22 year old self again and we got yeah. in that building and once we all finally got on the floor and the crowd is going crazy in there uh then all of a sudden you start to see quinn and then i think it might have been randy then you start to see quinn and and scott may and next thing you know here comes coach walking through and i tell wow. you that moment was for that moment he went back to being coach night. Yes, he did. Because you saw the energy he had. That yes. He had a long, 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 long time. And you saw the emotional roller coaster that he was on as he made his way to that floor and made his way over to Dick Vitale. And then oh, he started, you saw that feistiness in him again. He got kind of feisty. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Kind of, <laughs> and then on the floor where he's, I was standing next to him, Isaiah, a couple other guys, and he started screaming, defense. I saw you do that that day. <laughs> he looked over at me and he kind of said, get out. I got into this defensive position and started shuffling my feet and everything. And you went for that moment. I mean, I almost like felt like, you know, because you go through a defensive chatter with your feet and you hit the floor. Yeah. You know, I, well, I told you, my problem was going to be getting back up off the floor. So I was going to hit the floor. <laughs> oh, <laughs> coach, I'll tell you what. That would be the most moment of that, of that, that time seeing him in that environment. And you could see it and the love that the fans and the community gave to Coach Knight. And Coach Knight, it did. It put that fire back in him. And, you know, just mm -hmm. to see him kind of well up with a little bit of tear. There, right. I mean, there's, tw there's two decades of emotion right there that he had to set aside because, to me, that community and that, that assembly hall needed mm -hmm. that. And right. for, them to, for them to have that reunion – it needs to be a 60, uh, you know, a 60 for 60 documentary because uh, it was magical. It was moving. Uh, mm -hmm. It just it was just so powerful, Smarty. And, and, you know, for you to be right there and, you know, share that with us. I, mm -hmm. I just think it's it's something that, you know, I, I hope they can make a documentary about it. No, it, it, you're absolutely right, because each player has his own personal experience playing for Coach Knight. There you and go. He said some of it was was good for great for a lot of players. Some of it was in the middle. Some of it, it wasn't the way it, it, they, they thought it would be, and it didn't work out. You know, that's life. That's life. That's Come on. And then, unfortunately, how it may have happened to some players, you know. But yeah. each guy, it was each individual experience. So when people say, "Well, that coach night is this and that," I can only talk to you about my experience with him and what there you happened. Go. Because all the stories that I may have, the conversation that I've had with him, the situation in my life, going through everything that I went through, uh, uh, through my life, through, you know, miscarriages, uh, of being uh, home, lost a home with everything, you know, with so many Indiana fans, you know, knowing that I had just gone to my mother's house in Louisiana, picked up all the accolades of things that I had accomplished over the years of my playing, from playing and coaching, but we from playing. and to lose all that because now you yeah. got kids kind of have a little treasure chest so that when you look back your kids to be able to say oh dad had this he did that i lost all that didn't have any of that stuff gone you know? gone gone but through all the years of people collecting things they were sending this stuff back to me wow you know? and so wow. Was the same exact things that i had lost i was getting some of those things back you know beautiful you know, so it was, it was just one of those incredible moments um, in, in time to see that happen, you know, based on when Coach said he'll never return to Bloom. That's right. Yeah. For, for it to happen. But it took a, a, a strong coach, uh, who a guy who was a coach in Randy Whitman, to coach him to coming back. Because mm. he had some time, some quality, said, Coach, I think you need to get back there. You know, oh, I'm never going to go back. I'm sure those, that was the conversation. You oh, know, sure. Yeah, coach, listen, you need to be there. We want you there. And I think when he kept saying probably, I, I don't know, I wasn't privy to the conversation he had with Coach, but I can imagine that maybe he was saying, Coach, we want you there. Your players yeah. need 
see you there. They're all going to be there. And I think that may have kind of loosened up that string to say, you know what, let me go back there for them. Yeah, that's oh, seeing that's that's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing, Coach. I, mm -hmm. I, I, and again, to be able to sit here in Salt Lake City, Utah, watching that ESPN game, because there was starting to be a buzz that, hey, you know, mm -hmm. Coach Knight might be around. Of course, right. I knew that you were going to be there, but of course, I, I can't share that information. Right. I mean, that's that's right. stuff you don't talk about. It's it's right. for, it's inside. It's internal, and it's family, and that's the way it should be. But, you know, watching that moment and seeing that little tear kind of him well up and the love that the fans gave him and then just, you know, you all you players from all those decades being there, it was just a beautiful thing. And uh, thank you for sharing that with us because I know that, you know, it, it had to be so heartfelt and so much emotion behind it. Yeah, no, again, and see, even, even when, because we were all in that room waiting, no one was sure that Coach was coming then. Right, yeah. It, because he could have still decided, you know what, I'm gonna watch the game on TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow. It, it still, it's still because everyone was saying, "Is Coach here? Is he here?" Because we hadn't seen him yet, you know. And then finally, he walked into that room. And so, wow. uh, but again, what he talked about was is five, ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty years, thirty five years from now. I want this Indiana group of basketball players. I want them to have that feeling uh, of what we talked about uh, that they can now come back together as a group of players. And that's why I say sometimes when we start talking about uh, when I'll send a text out and start these guys, like if I send one today to a guy, I guarantee you I'm going to have this text running for a couple of days. You know, that's beautiful. Let's, let's, let's talk about all kinds of crazy things. You know, one of the things that we always enjoyed uh, at Indiana was when we would go on a road trip. And we would go through the, the, the process of, you know, you get there, you go to practice. Um, the next day you got a uh, study hall, you're doing your homework and stuff like that. And then you, you go through film sessions and then you go to get ready to go to bed at night. But at, uh, I think it was like 9.30 that, that night before the game, you couldn't wait for this tray that would come around, this little cart, someone bringing something to you. He would always get us uh, vanilla ice cream and apple pie. Wow. And, okay. You know, on the road trip, you know, it was, you know, the little cart would come up there, the guy would bring it up there, and we go to the hallway and get our ice cream and, and uh, apple pie, you know, little things like that. You remember those things, and you would go back to your room with your roommate, or some of you guys were all hanging out in a room somewhere, you know, and, uh, and, and just so many other stories that we would have. Uh, oh. with, you know, we always rotated roommates, we didn't have the same roommate. Because that was part of the, the whole bonding that you were having with someone. So I never had to, we didn't have the same roommate, you know. Um, there was a time, a game we had, we had played Iowa and uh, we lost that game there. And uh, myself and Rick Calloway were roommates. Ricky we were, Calloway. I think we were going to play Wisconsin next. And we, but we were still on the road. Then we played like a Thursday game or a Wednesday game and they had a Saturday game. And Calloway and I were roommates. And we never roommates. So we played this game in Iowa. Coach gets upset with us in this game. He calls us to his room once we land in Bloomington. I'm excuse me, landed in uh, Wisconsin. We go to his room, and and people always send Coach stuff when he would on the road. And so someone had sent him some uh, garlic crabs, you know. Oh. So in that room, eating these garlic crabs, and but he's getting on us because he's watching his film already. And it's probably not eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock at night. He's watching his film, and he's calling us every time to come back to this room to watch this film. We didn't have any rest, nothing, man. We go to practice the next day, shoot around, and Rick and I, he said, I want Rick Calloway and smart tape. And I want, and we never tape for shoot around, you know. I want those two tape. And Rick and I are playing over here one-on-one, uh, -on -one, you know. Just nothing, while the team is going through walkthrough, we're doing one-on-one -on -one training. And I'm thinking, like, there's no way we're going to play in the game tonight. You know, I mean, we are, they are putting us through it. You know, we get back, get our meal, get ready for the game, come back. So I'm not thinking we're going to play at all based on what we had gone through from the night before to that practice the next morning. And we get introduced as starters for the game and we play and we have great game. We have really good games, right? We finish the game. Coach comes up and says, uh, you see why rest is overrated? <laughs> <laughs> because you did this on limited rest 
but mentally you were able to get through it, you know, wow. which is incredible, you know, a moment that we had, you know, because yeah, was- based on the training and the workout that we had, we, you know, we always say, save your legs, save your legs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But we were so hard that we felt we had no legs, but yet we played a hell of a game. Wow. You know, I love it. Uh, the, all that stuff that you're sharing is beautiful, but you know, Smarty, you're also a cancer survivor. You were with the Miami Heat franchise at the time. And right. I can remember, you know, conversations with you and, and text messages back and forth when you're going through that. Kind of share with us, you know, what that was like when, you know, talk about the, the cancer, talk about the diagnosis, talk about what you had to go through, uh, mm-hmm. to, to go through that process with, with all the, you know, medications and treatments and ringing that bell. Mm-hmm. Share that with our viewers as well. Yeah, you know, uh, Scott, you, you, three of the most frightening words that any, that anyone can hear and be said or, or to them is you have cancer, you know, and I always had, had a little bump on the side of my left uh, the side of the left side of my face. And, you know, my family had keloid, you know, and so I just thought it was something like that. My wife, hey, your wife and your viewers and listeners wives uh, that are out there and girlfriends, significant others, when they tell you to go get something checked. <laughs> you, this doesn't look right. It doesn't feel right. Trust them on that because God has given them a, a sixth cent. Amen. They, they've given them something, right? And um, and so my wife would always be on me about, you need to get this check, get this check. And then finally, I said, all right, I'll do it. And so being in Miami, again, a championship organization, how they function, how they operate, you know, uh, just blew my mind when I got there to work there for Spolster and work with Pat Riley and how they taught and did things. And um, and so I go to a dermatologist right before summer league. I go to a dermatologist. He looks at it. He said, oh, yeah, this is a keloid, you know, an out culture, Asian uh, Indians, uh, African-Americans, uh, keloid is very, very prevalent in their that, that, that community. And he gave me some medication and I did it and everything. And then called me and said, how's it going? How's it looking? I said, hey, doctor, it looks the same to me. Doesn't doesn't look any different. He said, well, when you get back here after summer league, come see me again and we'll take another look at it. So I get back, go look at it. He takes a look at it, go, you know what? It it just looks different. I'm going to get you over to someone else. And being in Miami, because people retire there, you know, so they have some of the best medical situations mm-hmm. that I can possibly be in. And having a team doctors in Miami with the heat, uh, really helped him with this. This so I got sent to another doctor. He looked at it. He said, "Yeah, you know, we we're gonna biopsy it and take a look at it, and I'll get back to you and let you know what we find." So he did that. Went through it the process. He said, "Well, it came back benign. There's nothing there, um, but I did leave. Uh, we're gonna try to remove that that bump from your side of your face." So he did that. But he said, "You know, I left two percent in." Because I just couldn't go any closer because it was right near some nerves. Uh, and if I hit one of those nerves, it could paralyze you, your mm-hmm. left side of your face. So he backed out of it. He said, I don't know what it is for sure, but it's something that I just don't, I'm not, I think it's this, but I'm not sure. Ended up going to another specialist uh, there in Miami. And he looked at it and finally uh, comes back to me and uh, called me over to come see him. And now, here's the crazy part. We have a game that night. After shoot around, I go to his office and not even thinking about it. So I go get in my car and shoot around, drive over there. It should be a quick 15, 20 minutes, right? That morning, I put my suit and my shoes for the game in my car. And normally, I would, as you know, we would go to shoot around, go back home, bring our stuff back to the arena that night. But I put everything in the car today, preparation, right? So I put yeah. it in the car so I had it all ready. And um, and so I go to the, see him. We sit down and start talking. He said, you know, it's we're not 100 percent sure. This is something that's very, very rare. Um, and it's a it's a it's a type of skin cancer um, that's called dermafibrosis sarcoma protuberant. Long, long name. Right? And he said uh, it's very rare. It affects one in one million people. Mm one in one million people and you just happen to be this one <laughs> in this million here mm. and he, so um we're going to take a look at it and go through it and so i'm thinking okay you say i had cancer he said yeah it doesn't move around it stays in one place where it is but the issue that it has it's, it has these tentacles that will go out and move 
Now, mine being right here on the side of my face, right below my ear, well, there's not a lot of real estate. It's going across my face, up mm -hmm. my face, or behind. And of course, going up is going to my brain. He said, you know, if we don't get it under control, we got between three, five years, you know, and it'll be in your brain. And at that point, there's nothing you can do because it's tends these tentacles out. Mm. But we do everything we can to get this. So I'm in this place while I'm waiting to hear this news that I just received. I'm sitting there, you know, kind of not paying much attention because I'm still on my on my computer working, waiting for my appointment time, and I'm working everything. And then I just looked up and I realized. I'm in a cancer treatment center. Wow. And I'm watching different people come through here. I mean, in that time frame while I was waiting, just hundreds of people coming through. And that's just that place. So imagine this in other parts of the city, of the, of the state, and of the country, and of the world, you know. But I'm sitting there looking at all of this. Still has not hit me yet. Mm. Go to his office. He sit there. He said, now, do you, do you understand what's happening here? He said, you have a rare case of cancer mm. and we got under control. So he said, I'm going to call you back again. I'm going to present you to a couple conferences because we have not seen something like this in such wow. a long time. I'm going to present you at a conference and we're going to look at how do we attack? How do we, we go about attacking this? So I went back to the arena because now I missed my, my nap time is gone. I drive back over to the arena and get ready for the game, work out my players on the floor that I need to work out. And still not hitting me, still not hitting what has been said to me that you have cancer. And now I'm in this situation. We finished the game. Uh, I'm on my way back home that night. I haven't called Carol to tell her anything yet. And, uh, and I'm going through it for a couple of days. Haven't told anyone yet. A couple of days. Still haven't told anyone. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, I said, you know, I got to tell a few people. So I uh, called Spolstra and, and David Fisdale, Eric Spolstra and David Fisdale. And mm -hmm. I met at their practice. And I uh, said, man, I got to tell you guys something. Because uh, the doctor now has called me back and said, we, we got an idea of what we're going to be dealing with. And here are the dates we're going to have to have surgery and get you on this treatment. And that's when it hit me, you know. And I sat in front of them. And as they're waiting for me to tell them what was going on, I started, I broke down. Mm. And I, when you talk about friends, two guys that I'm very close with. They didn't know what it was that I was going through this emotion with. Yeah. Both of them started crying. Wow. Both of them. And I hadn't even shared what it was, but they knew it was something painful. Yeah. And so it was thinking that, man, maybe it's Carol or maybe it's the kids or what is it? You know, his mom or something like that, his dad, you know, whatever it might be. And then finally, um, I shared with them what had happened and what was going on. And those two guys just, just lost it. You know, wow. and I'm, these two great men sitting there feeling my pain. And obviously, I uh, told Carol now, Carol knows, you know, and I told, finally told the team because I'm going to have to be leaving the team. And I just share with them. I say, look, my, my kids don't know yet. So, uh, you know, please don't uh, tweet anything or talk about it on social media yet. My one son is getting ready, you know, in his finals and everything. So I hope, you you know, just don't say anything yet because I don't want them to worry about anything. And then finally, we get through that portion there, man. I go get ready for the surgery and uh, in Miami. And I go through a 15 hour surgery, you mm. know, and they had to use what was called a Mohs surgery. And what that type of surgery is that they go layer by layer of skin mm. to make sure that the cancer is not in any of those layers of skin. And it had to go really down about an a, a inch and a half into my face to get to those, uh, to get all those cancerous cells that they can get wow. out from a surgical standpoint out of there. And then of course, you know, we talk about our wives, man. So Carol comes down to Miami and now they're going to say, uh, where are you going to have your, your treatment? Where are you going to take place? And I was, I was thinking, okay, you know what? I'm going to do my treatments here. I can still go to work and work and things like that. And the doctor said, Keith, hmm. you're going to go home because it, it's going to be a tough road trying to come hmm. back. It's hmm. going to be a tough road. And while I'm in the hospital, um, <laughs> I know this funny thing happened. Spolstra and uh, his administrative assistant was coming by to see me. So I'm in the room. Now, they hadn't seen me in since the surgery and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So of course, with the surgery and having 15 hours and had to remove a portion of my face and then take uh, skin from my thigh yeah. to put on my face, you know, as a graft. 
And so they come into, I got these tubes stuck in my neck, you know, draining everything at, from the surgeries. And so wow. Spolster, Eric Spolster comes around the corner. Carol is sitting in the room. Spolster comes around the corner and he doesn't know what he's going to see when he comes into this room. Yeah. And I hadn't seen myself because I've been in a bed. So I haven't been to a mirror yeah. yet. So no idea what I look like. And then all of a sudden I look at Spolster's face and it's kind of like, oh my God. Goodness. Wow. Just the trauma to that area. Yeah. That area, you know, because this whole side of my face is just like, right. Because uh, it's just going through that recovery period. And uh, he looks at me kind of like, my goodness, coach, you know. And then we started talking about everything. And I, I, I know Fulcher very well. So I knew yeah. that that was the environment he needed to be in. So I didn't try to linger with conversation with him. I just, you know, hey, man, thank you so much for coming, man. You know, yeah. And he felt it, man. But he was he was doing all he can to keep me engaged with the team and stuff like that while he's coaching. Wow. Pat Riley was doing the same thing, you know. And eventually, um, we moved on. Uh, when the doctor said that, you know, you need to be around your family to go through this treatment that you're going to need to go through. Uh, I said, you know, I, I'm going to do it here. And uh, if I can stay around the team and work. Well, by that time, Carol had already, with the doctors, made an arrangement in San Francisco uh, for my my re my uh, my treatment that I was going to have to go through radiation and everything and um, they try to combat this thing and uh, they from the surgery did one portion now you got to go through the radiation and the chemo and going through it we get back here and I'm fine I healed up a little bit um, you know still got some swelling in my face but I'm, I'm I don't feel sick that's the thing but I, I didn't I never felt sick I didn't feel sick so now, you know, a couple of friends are calling just to stay busy, you know, and say, hey, man, let's go play some golf. So I was going to play golf and everything, go take my treatment on a Tuesday, you know, every, excuse me, every day uh, during yeah. the week. And uh, then go play golf and everything, just being home, watching film and still sending my reports because uh, I still was doing reports and sending them out to uh, Spolstra. And Spo just came back, hey, man, why are you doing these things? You don't need to be doing this. And so I was still sending my, my reports out to him after watching the game breakdown film because so I, I charted all our offense and defense and gave all the uh, analytical numbers uh, to send back to him. And I did those things. But then it started getting to the point when I got to uh, treatment uh, 15, mm. my energy now is gone the other way. And yeah. uh, I, I can't, by the time we drive from my house, uh, which is in the East Bay, uh, to San Francisco to get the treatment. I was asleep. I, I was asleep in the car on the way there, get the treatment, mm -hmm. and then I'm asleep on the way back, and then I'm home. And got to the point now, I can't even go up to my room now. I had to sleep wow. down, uh, you know, in the chair that I became my my home, my world, uh, where I stayed in. And so my kids would get up and go to school in the morning before I left to go for treatment. And they would see me there lying on the, in the chair. And then when they come back, I'm lying in the chair, you know, through the night I'm in the chair. And then I said, boys, I'm sorry you guys see me like this. You know, and they both just said, dad, hey, no problem. You know, as long as you're here. <laughs> you know, yeah, you're right, here. right. Wow. So I got through those. And then by the time I went from, from 15, I went up doing 47, 48 uh, rounds. Wow. Uh, Radiation and what they was doing, they were increasing my radiation by uh, twenty uh, by ten percent each radiation treatment. So they, this thing was so aggressive, they had to really, really wow. Low, you know, I lost uh, like forty seven pounds uh, mm. doing that, and I lost my ability to taste and smell. All that was gone. Uh, but you know, old steady Carol was right there by my side, getting me through it and everything. And I never forget this one Beautiful. time. I stopped eating. I couldn't eat. You know, food just didn't taste me. If you can't taste food, you don't like food. Yeah. And uh, so she said, okay, I'm going to make this steak shake. <laughs> so you ever heard of this? Uh, so she takes some, uh, some soup, vegetable soup, and a steak. And she puts it in a blender. <laughs> she purees she, it. <laughs> she purees this thing into a steak, man, in a shake. She put it in a glass and she gave it to me. She said, you're going to drink this. I said, no, I'm not drinking this thing. She said, you're going to drink this. I said, no, Carol, I'm not drinking this thing. And said, yeah, you're going to drink this. If I got to jump on you and hold you down and pour some in your face and some gets in there because you're not eating, you got to eat. Wow. And she did that. And I drank that shake, you know, and, but instantly I got energy right away because I wow. found out nutrients into my system. And, uh, and I said, I'd be the last one I drink, you know, so I made sure I started eating something uh, after that, you know, then we had a friend 
uh, who actually works for was working for the Raiders. And then she was a uh, uh, she was a chef, and so she decided heard about the news and everything. Decided that I'm going to uh, cook your food for you, um, and because what I was able to taste and eat was fish and rice. Mm-hmm. And so she started just preparing all these different types of fish and rice for me, and I was able to eat on eat that stuff and was able to get through it. And then my mom wow. just said, "Eat some grits and things like that." So long story, went through that battle of cancer, got through it, uh, finished it up, and was able to uh, ring the bell. Now while I'm in there, of going through my treatment, you know, everyone who's in treatment, you're there, you see each other every week for a long period of time, depending on how long you're there. You know, you're coming in. So we would come in, in the morning got to meet people, friends, some of their families. And we would uh, say, how are you feeling today? And everyone would lie and say, yeah, oh, oh, I'm good. good. I'm good. <laughs> good. And we said, you know, let's stop lying to each other. You know, when you're going through radiation or chemotherapy, mm-hmm. you don't feel good. You know, the day is not a happy day for you. You know, uh, yeah. you end up, and I said, let's just tell people the truth. When they say, how are we, you know? And I said, uh, just tell them the truth. Tell them we feel terrible. But what my, what my boy said to me, but you're here, you know, and a lot of people weren't there, you know. Yeah. And so as I finished up my treatment and going through treatment, you start to see different people who were able to continue the treatment program. And you saw people who treatment was being discontinued because mm. the point where they couldn't do any more for them. Yeah, it's now terminal. Yeah. Yeah. The day that I rang my bell, I it's two worlds that's taking place in this building. You know, you, you go downstairs into the basement to do your treatment and you get a chance to ring the bell. And then there's another group that's not going to ring that bell. Yeah. And the gentleman that was there, I don't know what, what happened to him later, but, uh, but this gentleman, he's in a wheelchair, a motorized wheelchair. Mm. And he said, coach, how you doing? I said, man, I just rang the bell, man. Just rang the bell. He said, I said, man, you're going to better ring your bell. And he said, coach, I'm not going to be able to ring my bell. My, oh. my, my treatment program is getting ready to stop because there's no mm. way any farther. And man, I was like, here I am excited to mm. have made it through. And here's this person on the same platform, mm. but not, you know. So yeah. you don't have respect for what you go through to, and see these people going through the, the treatment and the, and the cancer survivors uh, that are out there and what they face when they're going through it. Because it's not just you going through it, yeah. your family going through the whole emotional thing, your friends going through it, and they all yeah. would love to trade places with you, but I tell them all the time, you don't want to trade places with this. Because yeah, not on this one. This is uh, uh, so a journey that you, you know, go on and, and sometimes you don't make it. And uh, and there was another two other people that were in that group that kind of had somewhat of the same type of cancer that I had. Mm. One member, the, the, the cancer had gotten beyond where mine was, it had gotten across their face. So literally they had to remove their eye, remove a uh, oh. portion of their face and had their, uh, their graph that covered their face. Uh, another gentleman had uh, kind of the same thing and it was his went across the lower part of his chin and his, and his mouth mm. sort of portion. So here I was in the middle of those two extremes mm. with the, almost the same type of cancer in the same particular right. area. Mine just maybe let's say it's three years later where that is now you know um you know and before i was would, would have been kind of egotistical and say i'm gonna fight through this because i even thought about that i said you know what i trust in, in god i believe he's gonna yeah do this you know i'm not gonna take the treatment i'm not mm. gonna go through i'm gonna have my faith push me through this yeah and i just remember the old story hey i sent the boat to you during the flood and you wouldn't get in <laughs> yeah <laughs> right yeah oh. <laughs> so right. here are the great doctors that came my way that I was able to do that and uh, they were able to help me and and none of those doctors got into the ego part of it because yeah. the dermatologist could have said let me just give you more medication treatment uh the first doctor that had the first mental first portion of the surgery they removed um the bump he what if he would have kept going and would hit that nerve you yeah know, all, all things there we talk about moments in that championship game what if Derek Coleman make one of the free throws what if uh, the guy deflects the ball from behind me and I don't get a chance for that pull up. What if this would have happened over here in the slow motion world, you know? And so you just have to trust people that you're working with, trust the people in front of you and, um, and then get your ego out of the way. There you, you know? go. And that was it. Wow. That's, that's true, powerful. Man. That's powerful. That's smarty. Powerful. I yes, love sir. that. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know what? You and I, we're both 
very spiritual. We're both faith-based people. And, and I think that's one of the things that kind of attracted myself to you and your personality and just, just your ways. But I, I believe this, Smarty, and I'm not just saying this because you're here with me. God's not done with you yet, my man. And, uh, you know, the game and society is better because of people like Key Smart. And my prayers are that you're going to land back on a bench soon to where you're going to continue to impact lives just like Coach Bobby Knight did for you. And you're going to empower these people to make productive members in society. And mm -hmm. I see that going to happen for you soon. And uh, the game needs you, brother. Society okay. needs you. And uh, I, I just I, I I just have nothing but high praise for you. Mm -hmm. And and I thank you for your friendship. And uh, I, I'm going to tell you, I, I love you, man. I, I don't think there's anybody better. And I, um, you, I, I wish more people were more comfortable to share their feelings and emotions like that. But I'm just going to tell you, I love you. And I thank you so much for your friendship. And uh, we, we got to get you back on the sideline soon because the game needs you, my man. Now you, you, you know, everything that, you know, from us growing around and, and, you know, being in position short term coaching here, this team, that team. And I never got the opportunity to really get a full time position of coaching somewhere to hire you. I always told you, man, you're perfect because you went through the, the, the uh, coaching all over the world type thing, you know, the grind of being all over the world. And see, that's what coaching needs coaching, because these players, as you can see, would be playing overseas with your son playing. Players, they as they come out of college, they're trying to they want to go one place for sure. They want to go to the NBA, you know, or they want to just play a professional career somewhere, you know. Yeah. So you need people to be able to communicate those things to them who have already gone there. Because when I was over in Europe playing, I had American different American players on my team, and they get so frustrated with life. Yeah, you know, you're practicing all every day you practice hard and long uh two times a week sometimes with the teams that i played on and i said you gotta you gotta explore this great area that you're in yeah. because if, you're just going to get frustrated you know so able to communicate that to young players and young people about life and, and things that they're going to need to do um we, we we share these moments now because i started to look now don't look at next year with a player don't look at five years with a player. My teaching now, what I've learned over this last year was that I've been doing it wrong. I've been coaching and teaching players to be ready for tomorrow. Mm. Well, we got to be saying, you got to be ready 30 years tomorrow. Amen. Tomorrow. So Amen. We say, hey, you know, we always say, use the analogy, you cannot control the future. You have to focus on today. That's very true. But you might make it to the future. <laughs> that's right. And if you don't have uh, the skills and tools that's going to be necessary to make it to the future, you have lost a lot of valuable time. So I, I changed the way of my thinking. I, I use this little analogy now. I put three rings down, right? Three rings on the table. And those first rings, I want you to take four things, maybe five, but let's say four. You're going to put in that first ring, four things your faith, your family, uh, your friends, and your finances in mm -hmm. that first ring. And that was five years ago. You take that second ring and you put those same four things in there. Did you get closer to those four things from five years ago to now? Mm -hmm. That third set of rings, same four things. And that's what you're working on to build to those next five years wow and the rings now just flip over they just keep flipping over so you, you're always projecting out five years uh from where you are but based on where you were five years ago where you are now and then where you're going to be moving toward with those four things those are four things for me you know it, it could be something else for you love it put those things in there and so that's what you're trying to teach and that becomes coaching, as it becomes family, it becomes kids. Even being off this amount, this amount of time, this is seven years where I've had this amount of time being back home full time. Yeah, right. I had to learn how to live in the house again with my family. Yeah, sure. It's a transition. It is. And, and you go from zero to 100, back to zero. Back well, to then zero. again, you have to use those life skills that taught you to you know to have that passion have that purpose have that focus and yet still have meaningful 
productive relationships and yet right. still be a guide and a mentor, a father, a husband, and mm-hmm. try to be the best of those. Hey, it, it takes some life skills, brother. Yeah, it takes, and, you know, you have we got the oldest son that's here with us and yeah. he's working every day. You have to learn how to talk to him again before yes. you text or you talk five minutes. You know, you sit in the room sometimes and when I first got back here, like, well, what are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, wow. And then uh, we start saying things that we can communicate with about certain things. So I can start talking to him about, you know, as he's working every day and what he's trying to prepare for his future life and stuff like that. And, hey, I say, hey, man, look, what do you, what do you want to do? with your life, find a job that you love because you're going to have passion for it, yeah. you know, uh, and whatever, don't worry about what it's paying you. Then you right. have to look at other things outside of you find this job that you love. Now you got to look at other things. I want to keep doing this, but I need to figure out a way how I can continue to earn to help me over here so I can help with my passion. Cause you know, when you got your passion, you know, you can be there all day long. You yeah. can sit in the room here. With it's your not shirt. work. Yeah, and it's not a job. 15 hours a day and not even worry about it, you know? Yep. And so that's what you're trying to get across. And those, those are the things that uh, that I've been sharing. And like I said, I, I had to redirect thinking about just preparing for tomorrow, you know, just focusing on today. Yeah. And, and so let, let's, let's, let's just jump this thing and say, okay, where you need to be in when you're 55. Like how many how many kids have think, thought about their lives? Right. They, Five now, sixty, because you know that's a that's a whole nother ball game when you hit fifty-five and sixty. Yep, yep. You know, you got to now figure out how to play in that arena, and that's a different arena. There you, you know? go. That's so true, Smarty. So true. Wow, yeah. it's a uh, you know it's I this has been so enriching and I'm a better version of myself just because again I get to spend this kind of quality time with someone that I admire and respect. So thank you for empowering me with these tools and these stories and these experiences. Mm-hmm. And and I, I know if people have taken the time to listen, whether in a podcast or watching us on TV, I, I think this has been wonderful nugget shared, Smarty. And, and I can't thank you enough for, for your time and your friendship and your love. And uh, I thank you for you know, sharing it with us. And because I'm sure, you, you know, there's a thousand other things you could be doing and your wife probably needs you to do some stuff on the house and mm-hmm. your, the boys are there. But man, I, like I'm saying, I love you and, and I can't thank you enough. Do, do, do you have any closing words for our viewers here? I, I would just say, number one, you know, the, the fact that the platform you have, you know, you if you've allowed so many people to come on there um, that has helped other people. You know, you don't if you don't make a decision from several years ago, say, you know, what, I'm going to do this. This coach show, you something you've probably been thinking about, yeah. but all of a sudden you just say, you know what, I'm going to jump into it. So kudos to you, uh, to Kim, you. Uh, for you growing what you have done thus far. And Thank I always you. focus on, um, you know, how am I affecting the people I come in contact with? That's it. Yeah. No matter what their background yeah. are, their beliefs, their political beliefs, their faith. Amen. You know. You just impact them through your life. And that's what you've always been an impactful person around me, been an impactful person around all Thank the players you. I'm in contact with, uh, been impactful with the people you're reaching now. And so as your listeners and your viewers are watching your shows, you just know that you're pouring something into their lives, they can take it into their lives that you can apply to your life, you know? So it's Thank not you. just a coach's show, you know? This is, I say you go from, I was coaching, 12 to 15 players to all of a sudden now you're coaching 12 to 1500 or 15,000, 15 million people. So you coaching, once, once you become a coach or a teacher, you move from just coaching just that one person, you're coaching multiple people because now maybe what you talk to one person, they teach another person, you know, they teach another person, you know, and uh, that's the benefit of uh, being able to, to share. These are things that, some of us have always wanted to share, but never had a platform to share. And now you, as well as other people uh, that I've done some of these things with, um, has given people a platform to talk about that. So where you can just talk about stories and talk about life that can help other people. You know, having gone through cancer, I can share the stories. Amen. Um, having gone through coaching the NBA, playing in college, playing for major coaches, Things like that. You know, my other mentor coach was Coach Don Nelson, who mm. talked so mm-hmm. much about Nelly. You know, and uh, 
being able to play for a Hall of Fame coach and then work for a Hall of Fame coach and how they operate, you know, has been great. Uh, but I tell you, when your work that you do, man, because it's all positive, you're uplifting people, uh, you're growing your, 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 your company and you're growing your family along the way. And that's like you said to me, big things are, are, are just around the corner for you. Who knows, man? You may have one of these big shows on TV one day. <laughs> hey, if, if that's how the good Lord needs to use me, I feel blessed. And, and But you're getting the proper training because so many times we want to train at the next high step. Yeah. But we got to go through these little these little small places first to get to that next spot because once you get there, I've already done the work over here. Amen. So, so Amen, you. Smarty. Come on, brother. I love you. Thank you so much. And uh, man, let, let, let's 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 go swing some golf clubs. Uh, I, I'm not a motorcycle rider, but I'll get out there on the road with you just because I know I, I'm going to. I, we're only as good as the people we surround ourselves with. And if I can continue to surround myself with Key Smart and his knowledge and his experience, I, I'm blessed. I'm blessed and lucky. Likewise. Likewise, my man. Well, let's break bread together soon. Give Carol a hug for me. Tell Go Andre good. and Jared I said hello and I'm really okay. enjoying watching those kids growth. And, and you know what? That that Hawaii football team is pretty good because that number 23 out there is doing doing work. He's doing a little work out there, man. He's enjoying it, and I, we enjoy watching him. And uh, oh. and his brother and I, a brother, myself, my wife, we're all excited watching him and being a part of it. And and we, we, we just watch it. That's what we do. We just watch and support. That's it. There you go. I, I there you go. Him. You know, we do the same thing. Amen, brother. God bless you. Thank, Thank you man. for your time. Ladies right, and brother. gentlemen, again, this is the Coach Scott Fields with another edition of the Coach Scott Fields Show. And I pray and I implore people to please share this content and, and take these tools for your toolbox to impact your life and make you a better version of you, no matter what walk of life you're in. Stay blessed, stay healthy, health is wealth, and, uh, and, and share and spread love. We need to be united. One love. God bless and have a good day. We'll see you soon on another edition of the Coach Scott Fields Show. Smarty, thank you, brother. I love you. Thank you. Bring it in. Thank you for watching the Coach Scott Field Show, the nation's number one digital coaches show. This DVNA television broadcast is a Roar Media production. Don't forget to subscribe to the Coach's YouTube channel. Like and follow him on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Have yourself dressed and ready to go in the locker room for the next exciting show coming soon. Thank you for watching the Coach Scott Field Show, the nation's number one digital coaches show. This DBNA television broadcast is a Roar Media production.